Paul's continued, uh, I think by now, if you've been reading this, intense exhortation where at one and at one the same time he, he commends the hope of the gospel and he rebukes the Corinthian cor- congregation because they've got a lot of things wrong. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 is what we're looking at. The transforming power of the gospel. The transforming power of the gospel. Find that in your Bibles, if you would, verses 9 to 11. And then stand with me as we read God's Word, if you'll follow along as I read. If you don't have a Bible with you, we, we really, we're serious when we say we'd love to put one in your hands. And if you'll just let us know that you need one. If we can't lay hold of one quickly for you, we will get you one. Uh, every Bible ought to be read. And every person ought to have a Bible, even though I know uh, that because it doesn't explicitly condemn slavery, that it's on the chopping block for people who find offense with everything. So you better get one while you can. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. By the way, it also condemns homosexuality, which we're going to see, and go down the list of our, of our cultural confusion, and the scripture is, nails it dead on. Or do you not know, this he's just said here about, the, about how they're, they're defrauding one another, they've embarrassed the gospel by taking one another to court. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may we take it to heart today to first of all gaze onto the catalog of scandalous sins. Remember why in the recent past we have practiced redemptive, corrective church discipline and why it may be necessary again in the near future to do the same. Thank you. Please be seated. In planning the church at Corinth, Paul did not have the luxury of drawing from first or second generation Christians. In other words, this church plant was not made up of folks who had come to help him. (laughs) He didn't even have access to Orthodox Jews who might at least embrace uh, the the monotheism of, of there being one God. All he had to work with was the arguably one of the most hedonistic cultures in Asia. And I tell you, they would blush at America today. So in, in that context, there's, there's, there's temple prostitutes, there's men who engage with them, there's uh, immoral relationships of men with men and women with women. Uh, it's a culture that has no moral compass, so, so cheating and lying and deceiving in the marketplace is commonplace. In the light of this, he wants to be sure that the lifestyles that many of these Corinthian Christians came out of all right, do not find their way into the church at Corinth. He wants to remind them that the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to their hearts by the Holy Spirit is the power of God that saves them from their sins. Remember Jesus' name. Joseph was told when Mary was carrying Jesus in her, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from, out of their sins. So in this text today, I want us to see two things, the the tragic destiny of the unrighteous and the transforming power of the gospel. 
First of all, this idea of the tragic destiny of the unrighteous in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Or do you not know? In other words, he's, he's challenging them. Think through some things here. Because Paul was clear, I'm sure, when he preached to them. He did not imply to them, look, you just trust Jesus and everything's going to be okay. Uh, just come to him as you are and you can stay as you are. That's okay. No. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That is not where they are going. Do not be deceived. He wouldn't say that if there was not the possibility of professing Christians being deceived. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The Corinthians apparently were a lot of talk. Now, they were like the character talkative in Pilgrim's Progress. They loved to talk about religion, loved to talk about uh, the things, spiritual things. And there must have been a mindset that, that they could talk and, and that their conduct didn't need to be influenced by the gospel. It was just, just say it. What my friend R.F. Gates used to call saying faith, S-A-Y-I-N-G, saying faith versus saving, S-A-V-I-N-G, saving faith. Evidence of this is what happened in 1 Corinthians 5. Paul says you should be shocked. You should be ashamed. But you're not. And they were boasting about something about that. Isn't it great? Isn't it great that you can just love people in their sin? You know, isn't it great that grace is so, that it doesn't matter how you conduct yourselves? Did I tell you, when we preached on our passage, did I tell you about my experience in Nizhny Novgorod, Russia, when we were teaching the pastors there. I don't remember if I told you that or not. Where, where the Russian Baptists, real quick, real quick detour. Russians, Bab, Russian Baptists are taught by their, by their leaders uh, thoroughgoing Arminianism, that you can fall from grace. We went in there to teach systematic theology for two weeks with these, with these students who were trained to be church planters. Well, I've I'm not a very bright guy, but I happened to stumble across their history text that they were using in these courses. And in the back of the history text, Russian Baptist history, there was this confession of faith that had been the original confession of faith when, when Baptists were found. They were, they were founded by some German Baptists that came into Russia with the gospel. And it was what you and I would recognize as the, as the 1689 confession of faith which certainly does not teach falling from grace. And so I just took that as my, as my uh, outline for our two weeks to teach systematic theology to these Russian pastor trainees. Of course, we got over to, uh, toward the end of the our second week there, to the perseverance and preservation of the saints. And I just taught it as it was. In fact, I said, in fact, you find this troublesome. And I had referred several times in the course of our studies you know, what we're, what we're looking at, you can find this in the back of the history class textbook that you had just before I came. And so they began to, they pulled it and began to read it. And, well, we hit perseverance of the saints and preservation of the saints, and that's totally opposite of what they've been taught to believe. It caused no small uh, turmoil in the class. I'd been warned before I went, and I'd stay off of perseverance. I said, how do you teach systematic theology and you don't teach that? That's, and uh, when I found their confession in the back of their history book, I felt like I had a green light to, to go, okay? So uh, we did that, and there was lots of conversation about that, lots of discussion. And there was an older gentleman in the class named Dr. Popoff, and uh, I respected the man. He was a medical doctor take, auditing the class. He had, he had been in the, uh, in the KGB uh, work camps, and he began to really chatter. He didn't like what I was saying. Uh, but the younger students coming to me after class said, tell us more about this. 
And as we just searched the scriptures together, they began to, their, some eyes began to be open. And then they said this to me. This is the point I was trying to get to. They said, well, we had a fellow come from the States, and I think I know who it was. He was pastor of a mega church in, in, in the States, Southern Baptist, evangelist type, who preached a big crusade there in, in Nizhinov Garad. And he used this illustration. And I don't think they were telling me a story because they several had heard it, and then they agreed what had been said. They said, he said in his sermon that you are so sure. Now look how this ridiculous notion of the, of the perseverance and preservation of the saints can be reduced to once saved, always saved, no matter how you live. He said, we are so secure in Christ, which is true, that you can be saved, shake your fist in the face of God and say, God, I want absolutely nothing to do with you, and God still has to take you to heaven. I almost wept. I said, it's not what the scripture teaches, and I apologize that that man represents the denomination I come from. There's a mentality like that, though. I'll tell you that because that's, that's not a Russian thing. And that, in fact, there wasn't even really a Russian thing. It's not, even, not just an American thing. It's People believe that if they said a prayer, if they walked an aisle, if they signed a card, if some preacher dipped them in water, that they're saved no matter what. Paul's dealing with that mentality in Corinth. So here's what he says. Don't you know that if you're unrighteous, even after confessing faith in Christ, if, you're, if your lifestyle is one of unrighteousness, of wickedness, of unrighteous is, is to live without any sense of a righteous standard of God. It's, to, it's just to live as if there is no Ten Commandments, <laughs> or they don't pertain to you. He's... he's Pressing here people who may be in danger of what Peter talked about in 2 Peter 2.22. Peter says in 2 Peter 2.22, What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. He's talking about people who have apostated. It's the, it's the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. All, those, those predominant attitudes. You know somebody that's always dividing, always causing dissent, always creating division? I don't care how fantastic that person's profession of faith was. I wouldn't give them a nickel of a chance to inherit the kingdom of God. If it's a lifestyle, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I tell you, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who practice, a little word do there is a present tense, those who practice such things, it doesn't mean those who did that one time or did it the other day and repented of it, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what is this kingdom of God? It's, uh, my Greek professor, Dr. Curtis Vaughn, said this is talking about uh, not, the, not so much the, the present reality of the kingdom of God as the ultimate consummation. They will not inherit heaven, so it's sending them for heaven here, when they die. And so then you, you have here these, these descriptives. He says, don't be deceived. Look at somebody who's practicing these things and say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm sure thankful they made a profession of faith. No. You sin against them when you do that. You pave the way to hell for them when you have that attitude about people whose lifestyle is marked out by these descriptors. There's a term here we're going to get to in a minute, but it's... Men who practice homosexuality. Oh, I say this because people will disagree. If you read commentaries, they'll say these ten identifier the, the descriptors or nine descriptors. And the reason it's nine or ten is if you take men who practice homosexuality as one descriptive, then it's nine. But if you look more intensely, which we're going to do in a moment, how Paul describes two types of people in that. And it doesn't, it doesn't translate into our English 
like it should. You'll also remember as we look at this list that we've already seen these, these images. We've already seen these descriptors in 1 Corinthians 5.1. It's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not tolerated even among pagans. And then 1 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11. He says, I've written in my previous letter not to associate with people who are this way. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. We talked about that. You would just need to, to be taken out of the world, not to associate, not to bump into, not to be around, not to work around, live around people like this. So I'm writing now. Do not associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister who wants you to recognize them, to give them, to grant them status as a Christ follower. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So, this idea of sexual immorality, what does it mean? It's the, it's the word pornos. You hear anything in that? Pornos. We get our word pornography from that. Probably in the context of, uh, of Corinth, they would have recognized that term as speaking of someone who is a whoremonger, in other words, one who, one who pursues illicit relationships uh, as a matter of course. Whether it's a, quote, monogamous illicit relationship or whether it's a serial illicit relationship, but they would, they would pursue these. It also could mean, and would have meant this to the Corinthians, a male prostitute, a fornicator, one who, one who carries on. I need to be careful here. I know because we've got children here. One who carries on with another person, male or female. Female, if it's a female with a female, that's, it's totally outside the bounds of God's order. Male with male, totally outside the bounds of God's order. But if it's a male with a female, a female with a male who are not married, they haven't... They haven't come before God and, and been married in the Lord, then, then they're in this category. They're fornicators. If they've done this before and over and over, then they're adulterers. It's just simple. Look at the scriptures real quickly. Ephesians 5.5, 5, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral, that, that, again, this is this practicing, or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. 1 Timothy 1.10, the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. When we looked at 1 Timothy, we went through the pastoral epistle several years ago. You remember that. I told you this is just, he's giving a shorthand for the second table of the Ten Commandments. Hebrews 12.16, no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. Be sure that you're not like that who sold his birthright for a single meal. And that's the imagery here. Someone who pursues that, that pathway, sexual immorality, is selling their birthright for nothing. For, for something that's going to, for manna that's going to turn into worms. Hebrews 13, 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Revelation 21, 8, where, where it really gets ramped up as the Bible comes to a close and we talk about the end times. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. In other words, person whose life has lived out like this, it doesn't matter what their profession is, what they say with their mouth, it's, that's just saying faith. They don't evidence saving faith. Revelation 22, 15. Outside, talking about this, this is the end of the book now. Inside, we get together with the lamb. But outside are the dogs and sorcerers, the sexually immoral, murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. This idea of the of pornos came from the Greeks, and it was of one who prostituted himself for gain. We're going to look at another word here in a minute that's a little different. Sexually immoral. What about idolaters? This is one of those interesting words. We talk about them from time to time. And I don't do this, by the way, to say, wow, the preacher knows how to pronounce Greek. That's, I'm just trying to help you grab, grasp the, the sense of them. This word is not translated here. It is the Greek word idolatres. So it's just come over. They just took it and made it out in English. Idolater. 
It's someone who worships idols. It's a servant of idols or a worshiper of idols. Look at just real quickly some, some scriptures. To, 1 Corinthians 10, 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. In other words, they, they make no mistake about it, by the way. We're here today to worship the true and living God. Everybody you know is worshiping someone or something today. You may have driven past a neighborhood full of neighbors who are not driving out anywhere to go gather with the people of God. They are worshiping. Make no mistake about it. It's what they're worshiping or who they're worshiping. That should give pause. Colossians 3, 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and then notice this, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Real quick, quickly, we went through the Ten Commandments several years ago. It starts out, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto yourselves any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath. In other words, idols. Starts out there. It ends with you shall not covet. Covetousness, Paul says, which is idolatry. It comes full circle in the commandments. Covetousness is the inordinate desire of something that you set your heart upon and you have to have. And it can be a thing, it can be a person, it can be a pleasure, it can be a practice. And you have to have it more than you want God. You have to have to be happy. Can I be happy? Well, let me ask you. You know Jesus Christ? Well, sure. He doesn't make you happy. You've got to have this and Jesus to be really happy. Jesus makes me a little happy. But if I had Jesus and this, I'd be really happy. No. Well, that's idolatry. Adulterer. This is a, an interesting term here that just speaks of one uh, who, uh, who is willing to engage. Watch now. The previous word, immoral, the, the prostitute does this for pay. This one here does it for pleasure. That money's not involved. That's the meaning of the word here. Proverbs 6.32 says this, He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it, practices as a matter of course, destroys himself. The prophet Jeremiah said that adultery, the adultery of the Israelites, pollutes the land. What do you think this country of ours looks like from heaven? If illicit relationships pollutes the land, what do you think every gay pride parade looks like from heaven? Like we're becoming a really understanding and open people? No. That a cesspool is sucking in America, and not just in those relationships, in any illicit relationship. Man with woman who have not come before God to have the benefit of God's blessing upon a union. So you have this picture here. of people pursuing relationships just based upon their pleasure. What you and I would call, it's, it's not right, to, there's nothing normal about sexual immorality because they're, they're not sanctioned by God. Here's the bottom line. Any relationship not sanctioned by God is immorality. And then this, this picture of men who practice homosexuality. The literal rendering of this, if you were to take this combination of words that occur in this, is not the soft ones nor male bed partners. That's literally what it means. And so what, the reason I was talking about it goes, some commentators say that what Paul has captured here is both, both partners in a illicit relationship like this, the, 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 the softer one of the relationship or the, or the tougher one of the relationship. And that's true, by the way, you know this. If, uh, in, in male homosexual relationships and female lesbian relationships, you, you just simply observe it if you spend any time around it. So he's captured that here. So those are the five, four or five manifestations 
that Paul is, why does he just not pulling these out of the air? This, you could have walked into Corinth anywhere and encountered this. You could have encountered it. He's going somewhere with this. In fact, the people that he's reading this to, there are people in there just, it's just, it's just be reminded that's what the gospel brought them out of. Then he moves into these, what one commentator says, these next five terms relate to those who spoil the goods of others. In other words, the the emphasis is, the the first list is about about spoiling life. Ruining your soul. The other is about ruining other people. So thieves, word for thieves here is klepto. Recognize that? A klepto, someone who just takes. He, 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 he takes, not as a kleptomaniac, impulsively not realizing he's doing it. He takes because he wants. Klepto is what one commentator said, the difference between a, a, a klepto and a robber, a thief and a robber. A thief steals by fraud and in secret. A robber steals by violence and openly, and that's the d- distinction the scripture would make between those two. The uh, fellow who fell among people and was beaten, left for dead. Also, this can be used metaphorically of false teachers, people who steal folks away from the truth. Greedy. Greedy is, a, is an, an adjective of the, of the word covetous. We talked about covetous. To be discontent. In other words, they can't rejoice when somebody has something. You'll hear them. You hear it in our culture all the time. Well, it's not fair that he has that. Why don't I have that? I deserve that. And if I don't have that, guess what? He doesn't deserve it. That's greedy. And we have in this nation over the last 50, almost 60 years now, people who have enslaved a culture, a subculture of folks in the name of creating a a slave voting block out of them. And they have provoked and stirred up a greed, again, that would make Corinth blush. Drunkards, people who are by Proverbs stand are long at the wine. They don't control alcoholic drink. Some say the best way to control it is don't, don't mess with it. Well, that's, that's, that's a good, good model, good measure. But he's going after here people who get intoxicated, who do exactly the opposite. When Paul says to the Ephesians, stop being drunk with wine. Stop, stop consuming wine to the point, because remember, in some of these cultures, their, their wine was better for them than their water. Their water was not very good. But to consume so much of it that you come under the influence of it and you're drunk, he says, stop that. Drunkards. Revilers. A reviler is a person who, whose tongue just lays waste to people. They love to criticize. They love to find fault. They love to insult. A synonym of this is the word for slander. It's the word blasphemos. And then the swindler. It's a word used of wolves. People who take advantage, who extort others for their gain. Now that's the tragedy. That kind of lifestyle, not somebody who, who maybe did that at one time or who fell into that risk, that lifestyle lands you in hell. And so you come to this transforming power of the gospel. He has said this and then he makes this most amazing statement in verse 11. And such were some of you. And his emphasis here is that if, if you were that, and you now are that again, you will not inherit the kingdom. 
But if you were that and you were fighting the fight of faith and you were dealing with remaining sin and battling the flesh to the glory of God, if the fight is on for you in sanctification to be more like Christ, such were some of you. And so he reminds them, but you were washed. Commentators differ as to whether he's talking about the washing of regeneration, which, which I believe, or the washing of baptism, which have been, would have been in their culture a public coming out from denunciation of their culture and coming to embrace Christ. The, the baptism. So I want to read some text with you here. Ephesians 5, 25, 26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, the preaching of the gospel, the sharing of the gospel. And you come to faith in Christ. It is, it is the word of God, the gospel, the good news of Jesus living, dying, rising again for sinners such as you. And you're stirring and being prompted to repent of your sin and confess him by faith. That's the, the word washes over you. It cleanses you. But it doesn't just do that. Initially, it's an ongoing thing. That's why you need to be in the Word, studying, reading. That's why you need to be under the Word, preaching, teaching. It washes. It convicts. It comforts. There's another one, though. Titus 3, 3 to 7. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to to various passions. This is, this is Paul talking. And pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, not just that we were made aware of it, when it appeared, when it, when it came convincingly into our lives, He saved us. He rescued us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. We were unable to do that but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration. Regeneration cleanses. It is the, it is the application of what was taught in the new covenant in, in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, that I will cleanse them. I will take the heart of stone away, that is the, the, the stony heart that's impervious to rebuke, that's impervious to the witness of the Spirit. I'll remove that and I'll replace it with a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in them. This washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that being justified by His grace we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He says you were washed in the Word. Washed. Washed in regeneration. You've been cleansed. Don't be like Peter talked about, like a, like a Sow, you've cleaned up. The first chance it gets, runs and jumps into the mud puddle again. Sanctified. You were sanctified. Sanctification is an ongoing process, we know. But it has its a beginning point. The beginning point in sanctification. Watch how these things converge. We're going to look at justified. We're going to see you were washed, sanctified, justified. They converge together in our salvation. And so when you were saved, you were set apart from sin. Set apart unto holiness. And the process of sanctification begins. Look at Acts 26, 16 to 18. Paul's telling about his conversion experience. But rise and stand up to your feet. For I've appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's Paul. That's what he's doing here, by the way, <laughs> writing to Corinth. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. The warning of the Hebrew author. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, 
but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set, a, set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And the conclusion here, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God and then justified. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, by the way, he's not giving an ordo salutis here. He's not saying this is the order it happens. He's talking about, he's reminding them the precious things that happened to them so that they better, their lives better be a word, this what I was, Romans 5, 1 and 9. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since, therefore, we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Romans 8, 30. Whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he, those he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. He says this. He says, this happened to you. Brothers and sisters, it happened to you. It happened to me. What place do we have of running back to that which we were rescued from, which we were cleansed from? In fact, if we can do that as a lifestyle, Paul says this indication that you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God because you never entered the kingdom of God. And he, then he gives this Trinitarian glory of our salvation. He says, all this happened to you. This washing, this sanctifying, this justifying. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the idea there, the power of the Holy Spirit of our God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit undertook to save you. So here's the good news. No matter what your lifestyle was or is, you can be washed. You can be cleansed. You can be you can be set apart from that by the power of God. In the name of Jesus, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit comes and makes that real to you. And it, it does to the, he does that to the glory of God. But if you name the name of Jesus Christ here today, and you know others who do, who this list we read, it is not were for them, but is are for them then they are deceived. They need to be rescued. And if you're sitting here today and this describes you, you are deceived. And you need to be rescued, either saved or restored, recovered. We play around with it. God doesn't play around with it. Paul was not playing around with it. Corinth's got a lot of problems. It's an, it's an imperfect church. But Paul is pressing the power, the transforming power of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to stir them, provoke in them repentance where they need to repent of their own, of their own inconsistency, their, their duplicity, repentance where they, have, where they have winked at that of others, repentance where in the name of love they buried their head in the sand. Paul says, no, such were some of you. And I have no doubt when he, when he listed that list that he did that was read to Corinth, that there were people there who wept saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you rescued me from that. Thank you, God, that your grace is so amazing that even that was not strong enough to resist your grace. I have no doubt there were people sitting there who were uncomfortable when he read the list. Made very uncomfortable. And by the way, that's what the gospel does. The gospel comforts the afflicted and it afflicts those who've gotten comfortable in their sin. Praise God. If you're saved here today, such were some of you. If you're not saved today, then you are. Doesn't matter what you put up in front pretenses, you are. You are, and you will not 
inherit the kingdom of God unless you repent and trust in Jesus Christ to save you. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read this passage. And, oh, mercy. Sin is debilitating. It's insanity. Let's pursue these pleasures at the expense of your glory. We read these things, Lord, and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me your salvation, full and rich and free. And then we weep today, Lord, over those who name the name of Jesus and yet who are found on the list of those who will not inherit the kingdom, who are self-deceived. Oh, God, we pray for them, that you would grip them and rescue them and recover them, either recover them to yourself or bring them to yourself for the first time. Help us as a church to conduct ourselves in a manner that glorifies you and exalts Jesus Christ, advances your gospel, gives great sinners hope, and holds out no hope for hypocrites.